Hello, and welcome to episode three of The Book Table, brought to you by Backroom Whispering Productions. In today's episode, we'll be discussing and reviewing the series His Dark Materials by Philip Pullman. We'll begin with a general spoiler-free discussion, and we'll give you due warning before we begin our spoiler-laden section. Um, so who do we have here? And have you read the book before? <laughs> So we've got three familiar voices and an exciting new person with us today. Um, so this is Rebecca. I'm sure at this point everyone's sick of hearing from me. Um, but anyway, that's who I am. And yes, I have read this series before many, many times. It's one of my favorites. So I'm going to be one of those people in this discussion. That's all nostalgia. This is the best book ever. What are you talking about? So I apologize in advance. <laughs> That's all right. I'll be right there with you. Hello, everybody. I'm Edland. Like Rebecca, you're probably all sick of hearing my voice as well. And like Rebecca, I have read The His Dark Materials many a time since I was a small child. And I also think it is one of the best trilogies ever written. And I'm like, yay, I love it. Um, okay, I'm Shelly. <laughs> I have been on one, I'll say one and a half book table episodes now. Um, yeah, so I do also many memories of the series from when I was quite young um, but I haven't read it in like the last maybe five or more years and so I guess it's I don't know it feels very different now that I have well also I listened to it in audiobook form this time so maybe that's different but yeah so it's been a while but it is a, a series I love from my childhood I'm Dorothy. I am the odd one out because I never read this series as a child. I'm 24 years old and I read it. Actually, I'm only 73% of the way through the last one, but I, I know how it ends. So I might possibly be one of the more critical people just because I don't have as much uh, nostalgia associated. Um, but I guess I'm the new voice that Rebecca was referring to. I did do a, uh, a nanosode, but for the, if we're just counting the real book table, then I am the new voice, so happy to be here. And I guess I will start, and like I said, I love this series, um, although I think that it helps to say that I read this series um, first when I was in middle school, and I actually read it as part of like a church book group type of thing, um, had really interesting discussions about its impact on religious thought. Um, you know we were like 12 year olds so it was like it was a pretty deep discussion that was pretty interesting and then I read it again in high school and college when I was actually having personal religious struggles and really connected with a lot of the things that were happening in it a lot of the overall themes of the story and I kind of feel like it is like I do, okay I'm not gonna go so far as to say that like it's my version of religious literature but I think that it's pretty close in terms of the philosophy that Pullman expresses through the story. Um, I just, it's very, very meaningful to me. And I love the series. I really, really enjoy the humor as well as like the deep science fiction fantasy. I love the steampunk setting of the first book and all of that. So basically, I'm just super on board with it. But I also recognize that my connection to it might blind me to some critical aspects. So I'm really excited to hear Dee talk about some of the things she was critical of because I actually have never talked to anyone who didn't like this book. So oh. I am psyched for that. <laughs> Here I am! <laughs> in a weird way. Oh, you are so lucky because, man, Rebecca, I'm like you in that I first read this, though, I first read it back elementary school, but it does have a very special place in my childhood in that it was one of those books I I can recognize that when I first read it, I was reading it for kind of the story and, like you said, the great steampunk science fiction fantasy world and the humor, and I just wanted to know what happened at the end. Um, and I also, like you, went back and reread it through, like, high school and college, and I was going through a very similar sort of crisis of, uh, I guess, faith is the word that can be used for it, and it helped be through a lot and I really connected with a lot of the philosophies and things that Pullman was saying but then I also started reading it in college um, after I read Paradise Lost by Milton and started recognizing the whole that trilogy is an inversion of Paradise Lost and like sort of fell in love with how yeah. clever I thought it was mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah I thought it was so clever that way uh, well, yeah, like I mentioned before, I don't have this intimate personal connection, which I think allowed me to be a little bit more critical. Um, a little bit, just just a wee bit. 
<laughs> I grew up more with Tamora Pierce, and uh, we'll get into this later, but like, I was making some comparisons that weren't necessarily favorable between some of the characters in His Dark Materials and some of the characters in uh, the Tamora Pierce series that were really like my life growing up. And just reading it as an adult, I, I fully acknowledge that I come from a different perspective completely. Like, I cannot identify with the characters as much as I could if I had read it when I was 12. Um, so I acknowledge that. I, I did think the setting was interesting. I, I thought some of the ways that it was exposed were a little bit strange. Um, I would probably give it a B. Yeah, so um, I guess having not read them for so many years, I feel like I picked up on a lot more this this time. I never really got all the religious stuff when I was younger in like middle school-ish reading it. I don't know. I feel like I liked the characters a lot more. Well, mostly Lyra, but I feel like I liked her a lot more when I was, um, you know, first reading it and then on rereads when I was younger. And this time I feel like I just nitpicked a lot more. Um, So maybe I'm kind of sliding towards Dorothy's side, although I do have a lot of my nostalgia from when I was young and, you know, reading these many times. Um... So yeah, I guess I'm kind of in the middle. Like, I still like it a lot. I love the setting. Um, I think it's really interesting having all the worlds. Yeah, I feel like I find more problems these days. <laughs> now, when you said Tamora Pierce, were you talking about the Alana series? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you know, I didn't even read that. I didn't even know those books existed until this year. I read them a couple months ago. That was the first time I ever read anything by Tamora Pierce. And I wish I'd read that when I was young. Oh, you totally missed out. Those are so influential on me. It sounds kind of like those uh, filled the same roles that these books filled in you and Rebecca's lives. So, all right. Uh, the next subject to discuss is world building slash the world. Okay. So, are we talking for the whole series, or do we want to start like with the golden compass and move through each book? Um, well, we are meant to be spoiler free, so I'm not sure how we can cover some of the things from the third. Yeah, so maybe we should start with just book one, because I think there's so much world building done in book one. But I think it's interesting that for a book that often gets called a children's book, it's not very friendly in terms of its world building. It just kind of drops you in the middle and just says, go for it. I remember being a kid and, not, and reading terms like Panzerbjorn and Tokai and like not knowing what any of these words were. Just kind of rolled with it in my head, started trying to fill in the blanks. Like, I had no idea Tokai was a drink and actually said, yeah, it was pronounced Tokay. I was like, I don't know what this is. I don't understand where we are. But I think it was kind of neat that um, I happen to now, when I reread the book, I love that it's set in Oxford because I've been to Oxford. It's such a beautiful city. But as a kid, uh, there was enough description to sort of set my imagination flying really with it. And I imagined this really interesting city. But... I don't know, but when I was a kid, I was sort of imagining it's like, I suppose with clothing and period stuff around like the 1940s-ish. I don't think my brain went any further than that as a kid. I don't know. Dee you said it, things were introduced kind of strangely. Strangely, Was that in like the first book with the woman? Um, no, that was more introduction of different elements in, I guess, mostly the third book, but also the second Mm -hmm. I felt that it was kind of like, I want to introduce something interesting. And then he like went on one of those character generators or something. It's like, here it is. (laughs) Ta-da. But it's hysterical. Um, I mean, I know it's not possible to foreshadow some of the things uh, for spoilery reasons, but mm-hmm. I don't know. It's, it, there were definitely points where it seemed disjointed, like, uh, I guess I'm going to have to make this happen, so I'll introduce this thing to help make this happen. Mm-hmm. I, I have to be really vague here. Gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, the, the spoiler-free section at the beginning is very vague. It's true. Um See, I don't know. I I can't actually remember what my like first reaction to the world was when I read it, um, or if I had any issues. But you know, it's one of those where like I read it when I was so young. Now when I read it, I'm so familiar with like the world and the characters and the terminology, um, especially in the Golden Compass. Um, mm-hmm. so- oh yeah, there was a character. Shelley and I both listened to the audiobooks, and there is a character whose name is pronounced a certain way in the audiobook that I guess the people who read it never thought of. Which one was that? 
Is that is that spoiler? No, that's not a that's that not a spoiler. Okay. So you're talking about okay. Yorick, right? Yeah, yeah. In the audiobook, which oh, I was Yorick? listening to as I was like driving across the country. Oh yeah. It's it, to me for, having hearing it for the first time in this whatever British actor w- voice. Yeah. It was very very clearly Yorick Bearson. Like bear. Like he's a oh, wow. bear. His name is Bearson. <laughs> I did not catch that. And well, then I saw I mean, that I knew, I knew in it, the, but... In the book discussion group on Facebook, I was like, wow, really? Bear named Bearson? Like what, Mick Bear? Um, and nobody got it because they had been reading it as Bearson. Well, because it's not spelled bear. Like it's B- B-Y-R-N or something. And I think that I the way I've heard it um, or the way I heard it in my head is similar to way I think the way they pronounced it in the film, which we can have a whole other discussion about the film and how terrible that is. <laughs> but it's... More like Burnison. So it's like Yorick Burnison. Yeah, that, yeah, that was uh, how I... in the audio from what I remember, but maybe Dorothy yeah. heard it differently. Yeah, I feel like I need to go re-listen to that. I was just driving along the same road for like 200 miles, so I thought that I had pretty good focus on the audiobook. You probably did. No, we're not like arguing with you. Yeah, I also yeah, listened to some be... of it while I'm driving long distances, so... Woohoo! <laughs> Yay! Yeah, it could be that for any of us, I mean... I've listened to the audiobooks many a time as well because I I quite enjoy audiobooks. Um, and I think there's a point, I don't know if this is a sciencey thing or not, where maybe you've heard something so many times it just and you expect it to sound a certain way that you inevitably just kind of start hearing it that way because I now feel like I need to go re-listen to that. I don't remember this, but I'm sure you're probably right and my brain just sort of filled it out because I always imagined it as being pronounced kind of like Bjornison or Bernison. So that's what I thought I was hearing, and I'm just sort of yeah. That's, that's actually how I felt about uh, Voldemort and Harry Potter because I grew up like taking French as a second language, and then I listened to some of the Jim Dale audiobooks before they changed it to match the movie pronunciation. Mm-hmm. And so then, when this a few months ago, everyone's like, "OMG, it's not pronounced Voldemort." Oh my god! <laughs> like, yeah, that I made me laugh. Kind of, uh, so <laughs> like <yeah>. duh. <laughs> that made me laugh so hard. Yeah, because I've never taken French, but of my parents are fluent so when I came to, whenever I couldn't pronounce something I used to go to my parents be like how do you think this is said? and they both agreed that they thought it was Voldemort and like there was no T like it wasn't there and I went oh okay so when I started hearing Voldemort for the first time I found it kind of weird and then I took Latin and I just sort of started dealing with it <laughs> yeah I don't, I don't it's very interesting to the, now that I'm thinking about this because like when I know when I read the books, especially in high school and college, when I was like more aware of what I was reading, I knew that they were written by a British person. So I don't know if you guys do this, but when I'm reading books that were written by people from foreign countries, I read them in my head in like the accent of that country. Oh, absolutely. I do that. <laughs> yeah. So that's something that I do. And so in these books, like just everything has like a British accent to it. In as much mm-hmm. as my head can reproduce that, which, you know, whatever. Except for, of course, Lee Scoresby, because he's a Texan. But, he's uh, a Texan. He's our cowboy. But the Audible... So the, you guys have all heard the audiobook for The Golden Compass. I have an, never heard it. Um, <gasps> is it is it narrated in a British accent, or is it it's narrated, narrated in an American accent? It's a full Philip cast. Pullman. Yeah. It's narrated it's by full, Philip Pullman. But who... But is the narrator, so Philip Pullman reads the narration, and then yes. all the characters have appropriate accents. Yes, because they're all done by different actors who portray those characters in their appropriate accents. They have voices. Okay, can we also say, can I say that the Egyptians, I have to say as a kid, I never knew how to imagine them. I think I was imagining them as some sort of equal parts Egyptian, just because of the name, and then equal part gypsies. So... Do, are I they definitely... supposed to be like the Romani? Yeah, like aren't Egyptians? they just yeah, they're yeah, gypsies? That, that was my impression. That's what they I thought. They're definitely supposed to okay. be like Rom- Romani gypsies. Um, okay, and good. <laughs> more like the ones from like Eastern Europe, I think, as opposed yeah. to the ones that are sort of more in like Northern Europe. Um, yeah. And I love them. So this is one of my favorite, even though what kind of annoys me is that overall I feel like they're not as important to the plot as they really should be is I literally have a book that I started writing my on my own because I was so interested in um Roger's older brother oh yeah who only appears as a character in the golden compass in like a very brief scene 
But there was something about the scene where he appeared that to me felt like it was going to end up, he was going to be a super important character. And like, this was all going to be like really critical to the plot. And (laughs) so I got like so interested in him that I have a whole book that's like based on who I call the river people that are very like close to the, anyway. um, So that's, I guess, technically a complaint I have is that, some of the characters I feel are introduced in a way that makes them seem like they're going to be extremely critical. And then they literally never appear again. So I think that's a pretty fair criticism. Um, writing style. So the writing style in general. I like, I it. thought it was all right. <laughs> yeah, I liked it. Do we have any, <laughs> do we have anything to say about what we liked or what we didn't like? I kind of, like, at the time that I was reading it for the first time, I didn't really see a lot of things written the way Lyra talks. So, like, her accent and her, like, bad grammar and stuff like that. But then I... I ain't going to do it! I ain't! (laughs) And then I found that it really annoyed me in the audiobooks. Like, I was totally fine with it earlier, but I just... I don't know, maybe I just didn't like the voice actor for her. Voice actress. Yeah, I think it's also just the accent. Like, it's a very particular type of of British accent, and so... Like, when I, obviously as a kid when I read it, I didn't pick up on this. After having studied abroad in England and then coming back when I read it, I'm going, oh, no, I can hear this in my head. And then when I listen to the audiobook, I go, yep, that's it. Mm, that just kind of grates on the ear. And I think it is also the part of the voice actress in that it's, like, she's not necessarily bad, but she has a something about her pitch and the way she plays that accent that's sort of like okay this is a little grating at times i think she was part of the reason i didn't like lyra that's a fair (laughs) assessment i could see why yeah that's that's so fair because i yeah i started disliking her a little bit at this reread or re-listen so yeah i don't think so i know we're gonna talk about this later because this is a topic that do you really want to talk about but i'm not sure that Lyra or Lyra or however you want to pronounce her name because I'm going to be real. I always pronounced it Lyra. Oh, really? um, <laughs> In the audiobook, she's Lyra. No, I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be Lyra. Everybody pronounces it Lyra, but I actually had a friend named Lyra and it was spelled the same way growing up. So that is just how it was pronounced in my head. But anyway, I don't know that she's necessarily supposed to be particularly likable, especially towards the beginning of the Golden Compass. Like, she's just a bratty kid. Mm-hmm. And is really only the protagonist because she's going to end up being important and is the only person that could be the protagonist. No, she shouldn't be. She should just be put in jail. (laughs) Sorry, oh God. (laughs) Julie! Well, I think I remember the author saying at one point that she wasn't really supposed to be, well, she ended up being special, but she wasn't really supposed to be as a person anything special. Like, she was just a normal girl who got caught up in this and then ended up being... Yeah, it's just kind of like the circumstances of her birth make her... Which, Mm -hmm. frankly, I find particularly fascinating, and I love that, not only in this book, but in other books, when the protagonist isn't, like, a hero. Well, then you would enjoy the girl on the train. Oh, (laughs) God, no. The, like, heroic thing, or, like, whatever. (laughs) But she's so, like, I don't, I would never say that, like, I love Lyra, and Lyra is my favorite character, and she's such a great heroine, and she should be put on a pedestal next to other great heroines. But I think that she's a necessary character for the way the story goes, and I like a lot of the choices she makes, especially towards the end of the third book. And I don't think that another character might have made those choices. Um, And so what I like is how real she is and how well Pullman seems to know her and realizes her as a character. I mean, she's real, but she's really obnoxious. (laughs) I don't know. Personally, I tend to prefer books where I like the main character. Sorry if that makes me weird. No, not at all. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I think as a kid, I never really thought much about Lyra. I mean, as I think about this now with the 2020 of hindsight and retrospective, I, I don't ever think as a kid I said, like, Lyra was my favorite heroine. Definitely a kid. Hermione Granger was up there because she was bookish. And I was just like, you, me, we are all made somehow. Well, but, also, um, let's be real. Hermione Granger is the greatest <laughs> ever. But Yeah, I know. So it's like, you can't compare. But as I think as a kid, I didn't really... 
I, it's not that I really loved Lyra, but I didn't really hate her either. She was there. She was the protagonist. I was following her story. So I was like, okay, I'm with her. I found all the characters around her far more interesting. And like, I really wanted to know about them. And I loved the story and the world. Now, when I'm older and I read them, I can freely acknowledge, especially in the Golden Compass, that I'm like, wow, she's just not no spoiled brat. Wow. Like, were this my child, I'd be dragging her by her ear and, like, being, okay, we're going to sit down and have a nice talk about manners. How's that for once? Like, I suddenly start to understand a little bit of Lord, Lord Asriel's, like, shortness with her in The Golden Compass where as a kid. I'm like, man, mean adult is being mean. But, like, when I'm older, I'm going, no, I'm kind of with him on this one. <laughs> like, he should be giving her a talking to right now. What's interesting is that he always talks about how he thinks it's kind of weird that these are classified as, like, children's books because Mm -hmm. the subject matter they deal with is really heavy um, and they're really, like, kind of intense and complex stories. And so they're kind of like children's books, but really for adults and what even is genre anyway. But I think it's true. I definitely, as I've grown up, like Lyra less and less. And I think that definitely she's written towards i mean she's a kid and so she's you know at 11 12 how old is she at the very end she's no never older than she's 13. like i think she's 13 teen ish at the end because she hits like it's basically she hits puberty at the end of the book. yes she hit puberty at nine these days so. well, well she like, hit puberty oh, at 13 that was a different time but, <laughs> but when i was like 12 and reading it i don't think i found her as annoying i think it's when you get older mm-hmm. so maybe that really was written geared towards children or is what makes it more of a children's thing is that she kind of is a preteen and does things that preteens would do and that's why preteens identify with her and since we're reading it as older adults and we actually like are you know rational humans she's more annoying I don't know. But, like, Alana's a preteen, Hermione's a preteen. Okay, wait, wait, wait. We're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about this later with details. Yes. We're still in the yeah. spoiler-free <laughs> section. Yeah. Uh, writing style. Right. I will Back say, on track. I will say, though, at least with Lyra, and in terms of her behaving kind of like a preteen and jumping off of that, I mean, Pullman was a teacher. I wonder how much of Lyra maybe came from some of the students he interacted with. I don't know if he worked in a gender-segregated or uh, school or anything. I know he was a teacher and he was interacting with kids around these ages all the time. So I wonder how much of like Lyra came from various students he might have had. I don't have that. I just wonder if maybe that's part of it. So back Any to other writing, writing style. style? <laughs> I guess that was all under writing style. I mean, I think I mean, writing I, style. I think about writing style. I think about characters and like. How do they come across? Um, and I think that he does a good job with characterization. And all the characters are very real. They're interesting. They have different diction. That's important to me. I don't know if I successfully do that as a writer. But as a reader, I like it when you can recognize a character by their speech patterns and their vocabulary and the kind of words they use. And I think he does a phenomenal job of that. Whereas the different people from different social classes, different age groups, different worlds, eventually different places all have very distinct speech patterns. And I like that a lot. I don't know how other people feel about that. Yeah, no, I thought that was, especially like Lee Scoresby and York Bernison. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I thought that their like unique cultures that they had grown up in and sort of brought with them were evident in their, in their writing and in their actions too. So yeah, definitely points for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Yeah. I also noticed from the audio that the, a lot of the speech just kind of flows into each other without like um, dialogue tags or whatever they're called. So there's not really that yes. much narration, which which really worked well for the audio. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. There was there was moments where I was like, "Huh, haven't heard from the narrator in a minute." It's just you know this person talking and then that person talking without the comma she said, mm-hmm. which is is good. I like that. Yeah, agreed. I like that a lot too. Especially I think if you're then trying to listen to it because it's almost like getting a kind of radio play in a way, because you don't have that whole she, he said, she said bit going on. It's just people having a conversation and talking over each other and just continuing on and on. And the actors especially handle all the changes in um, accent and in, I usually call it cadence, but I think it's what uh, was called the flow of the way people speak. General plot? (laughs) General plot. (laughs) 
Uh, How are you supposed to do that without spoilers? Oh, boy. Well, just, you know, is it an interesting plot? Do you find it compelling? Are basically the kind of two. So I would say yes to both of those. I think that the plot of both the first book and the entire series, I find both fascinating and compelling. um, And I wanted to keep reading all the time, even at the beginning of The Subtle Knife when suddenly everything is very different. I was really into it. So uh, I don't know how you guys feel about that. Um, yeah, I same. agree. Yeah, then <laughs> kind of the same way. Like, I like how much it changed from the first book to the second book, which I like kept it intriguing. I was just gonna say, I think my frustrations with the characters kept me from getting so into the plot because often I was like, "Well, you wouldn't be in this problem if you hadn't made that stupid decision," <laughs> and that's that sort of stopped me from getting as engrossed as I think I could have. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. I do think it's interesting that he chose to have the second book start off somewhere completely different and with a completely different character. Because I remember being a kid, picking up the second book, and I wasn't entirely sure I was reading the right series at first, even though I'd been given the first two in, like, a mini box set. And I was reading I'm like, wait, I'm really confused. Where are the demons? Where's where's Lyra? What happened to the, the Northern Lights? And what the hell? I was so confused as a kid. But obviously when Lyra comes into the story X number of chapters later, I went, oh, okay, yeah, we're definitely in the same story. Okay, whew, I feel a lot better now. But then I love, I normally hate books that end off on cliffhangers, but I gotta say the, the cliffhanger at the end of Subtle Knife made me so much more excited to get into Amber Spyglass even though it took me, like, you know, five years in between Soul Knife to read The Emperor's Spy Class. I was just going to ask if, um, as much as we can maybe say without spoilers, did since um, we were all rereading it again as young adults, older people, I guess, whatever, um, did anybody else catch on to the overarching plot that really kicks in in book two? Like, did they... Did you sort of start to figure out what was being done, per se? Like, I, I mentioned before that it's an inversion of Paradise Lost. And I remember one time when I went into reading it and I caught on to it. It, for me, made it all the more interesting, especially because I already knew how it ended. But I got to look through it through a different lens. Did anybody else, like, catch on to that at all? Maybe especially you, since you were reading it for the first time. Um, I can't remember when I read the synopsis. Mm-hmm. Um because I was starting to get worried that I wouldn't be done with the whole series in time for this discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, just had a lot going on, and it took me a very long time to get through the audiobook of the first one, since audiobooks are slower than reading. I gave up and got the book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I didn't... That was a, another part of my frustration, as far as not enough foreshadowing. Obviously, there's some things that really, truly can't be foreshadowed, but, like, if an adult reading the series for the first time doesn't even get a hint, I don't know. I, it's far be it for me to say, well, you should have hinted at it more. <laughs> um, but I think that probably would have kept me engrossed in the plot further. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not saying if I went back now, I might be able to pick out something. But it was just kind of general. Oh, there's these two organizations and they're kind of against each other for some reason that our flawed main character doesn't understand. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, that is kind of a fair criticism of it. If you if you don't know what it is when you go into it and there's no hint being given to you, it can be very frustrating to read it. And I guess there are times where Pullman really likes to hold off on any form of foreshadowing. He just, just like, nope, you're just going to keep rolling and I'll just drop the bomb on you later. It's fine. Yeah, well, see, the thing is that I think what's interesting about it as a trilogy is that really like the main overarching plot you don't get to until the second book where the first book I mean it kind of ends on a cliffhanger but it's also sort of a closed story and in a lot of ways a closed universe because it the golden compass is very different from the subtle knife and the amber spyglass and I think the subtle knife is also different from the amber spyglass but they're more the same sort of genre there's more of the same stuff going on um whereas the golden compass is really its own thing But I do think, in terms of thinking about the inversion of Paradise Lost, the Golden Compass introduces, I think, what are a lot of the main philosophical points. And it's dealing a lot with, like, innocence and what is childhood and what's lost when you grow out of childhood. And I think that that, some of the things, you know, of course, 
the main plot of the Golden Compass dealing with the Snatchers. Or, oh my god, is that what they're called? No, they're called the, the Gobblers. gobblers. <laughs> the Gobblers, yeah. The Oblation Board. <laughs> you know, dealing with that is... I, you know, I know Philip Pullman doesn't like foreshadowing, there's no foreshadowing, but I think that's actually a really interesting metaphor for what happens later in general with the big plot and Lyra towards the, Lyra and Will towards the end of the Amber Spyglass and everything that's happening is a very similar setup to what the Ablation Board is trying to do in the first book, but it happens different. Okay, I can't, this is hard to do without spoilers. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have started. No, I guess I can also mention that I haven't read Paradise Lost. So, oh, if there's yeah, I also have the foreshadowing in there, then I did not get those hints because I was not informed. It's uh, actually not that bad a book when you get down to reading it. But well, yeah. it's not that I ever thought it was a bad book. It's just that it, I, it was never like assigned reading for me, mm-hmm. and I yeah. just didn't take any of those higher level literature classes. Yeah, I've but always wanted D, to. Read I do it, but... have to tell you, um, and Shelley too, if you haven't read it. That, like, obviously, you know, at some point in your life, if you're interested in this sort of genre, it's, I mean, the fall and narratives about the fall is literally, like, what I do with my life in school and my research. So, I, you know, that's why I have been exposed to it. But you are probably way more familiar with Paradise Lost than you think you are. Mm -hmm. Most of, in popular culture, most of what people think about the Genesis story actually comes from Paradise Lost. Like, yep. the idea of the apple and just, like, all of that. It's paradise So, lost. and if you sat down with the actual Genesis text, you would be like, wait a minute, where's this element and where's this element and this didn't happen and this didn't happen? Because that's all, that all comes from Paradise Lost, which is people are way more familiar with in popular culture than the actual Genesis story, which is interesting. So you are probably more familiar with it than you think you are. It even made it into Star Trek, guys! That's what, <laughs> Is, has anybody ever seen, like, old-school Star Trek from, you know, like, the 60s? Like, the old original mm-hmm. episodes? The famous villain, Khan, who quoted, or he referenced Paradise Lost to Captain Kirk. He was like, are you familiar with Milton, Captain Kirk? <laughs> the whole, um, <laughs> better to reign in hell than serve in heaven, which is what he was quoting at him. But I'm like, man, guys, Paradise Lost even made it into Star Trek. <laughs> it's everywhere. Yeah, if it's if that uh, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven thing is a Paradise Lost quote, it is also in an Avenged Sevenfold song. So that's yep. fun. Oh. But then yeah, again, they is... did a whole song about like Cain and Abel. So. Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask if anyone remembers. There was a quote from it at the beginning of the Golden Compass, right? Am I not? I think it's that? in the I think third. So. I think it's Amber Spyglass, actually. <laughs> You're absolutely right. It is in uh, my books is more than lines. Mine's a UK version. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. the Into This Wild Abyss Womb of Nature. It's from book yeah. two of Paradise Lost. Right. Yeah, I saw that. I was like, oh, it's going to be this kind of book. <laughs> 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 Title drop. Boom. Uh, Rebecca, do you think that his Dark Materials as a child influenced your, your love of researching this stuff? No. Um, well, no. I mean, I guess you completely I get, disconnected. <laughs> no, I mean, I guess you can never know, like honestly, like what's going on subconsciously. But I'm gonna be real. When I started, so I recently was accepted into a PhD program to actually talk about like Lyra as an Eve character and the inversion of the story of the fall and um, a lot of stuff that's going on in his dark materials um, and thinking about sexuality and the way it's what's important about his dark materials versus the popular narrative of the fall anyway um that literally like did not come to me until college and i actually and so this is i was at a a conference for medieval literature and someone did a presentation on paradise lost and that was honestly the first time so i was like 21 years old and had probably read his dark materials like eight million times and it was the first time I actually drew the connection between his dark materials and Paradise Lost and realized that his dark materials is really like just an inversion, not just an inversion. There's so much more to it, but it, the overarching narrative is an inversion of Paradise Lost. And then I read some interviews and found out that in fact, like that's what it was intended as. Um, and so that's kind of, so his dark materials being involved in my interest in the fall narrative is relatively recent and you know who knows it might subconsciously have always been there but i definitely was not consciously part of the reason that i got really interested 
All right, are we ready for the spoiler section now? I think we're ready for spoilers. <laughs> He really wants to talk about Lyra. Okay, I pulled this quote from uh, Amber Spyglass, and it says, Foul-mouthed, ignorant brat with dirty fingernails, bright but not intellectual, (laughs) impulsive, dishonest, greedy. And that's how I feel. I think that's a very (laughs) proper description of Lyra. It's it's absolutely spot on. (laughs) It's like, like, okay, so let's be real. This is who my character is. I have disagreed with like 80 percent of the decisions that she makes like she is almost that bumbling character who should have been dead 500 times <laughs> it's like it's a darn good thing that she has little sidekicks to be like hey maybe you shouldn't jump off that cliff into a void except they fail at holding her back half the time it's like hey maybe you shouldn't lie to your death and commit suicide by lying to death maybe that's a bad idea she doesn't give a shit yeah, it's a good thing everyone loves her somehow. Why? Why does everyone love her? <laughs> That's a really like, good uh, question, though, when you what's think his, about what's it. What's his name? Lee. The Lee's Lee's Scorsby. Scorsby. Lee Scorsby. He's like, I love this girl like a daughter. And you're like, why? Well, yeah, he's kind was, of an odd dude himself, though. Like, I can sort of see well, why they get along. He was a cool dude. <laughs> Oh, I, he love, was way I think that what he I admires in her is that she is so just like ballsy she decides what she's gonna do and she just does it and i think he really admires that about her and it's one of those things that actually you find that in all over literature and movies and stuff where adults who do not have children find precocious children to be just like amazing and love them a lot and then you know that if they actually spent like a decent amount of time around them they would hate them yeah, but, it's because they're not their responsibility. He's like, this isn't my child, yeah. so I don't have to take her home. So right now she's charming. If I had to take her home, I would not find her so charming. Like in real life, balls will not get you everywhere. And that was like, that was the lesson of the Lyra narrative was like, hey, just act like you know shit and everyone will hand everything to you on a silver platter. Like, you've never been to this universe before. Why don't you go in and start lying your head off when you don't know any, like, facts to base your lies on and you'll be just fine you'll make all the right connections and then it, it started failing too to figure out like it, like, it didn't work forever on. that's true At she did have some started. moments where they didn't work yeah. but to be fair a lot of the times where they didn't work like our world for lack of a better term it's because she was up against um uh, lord boreal who was from her world so he already knew her so that's why it didn't work and it was sort of like oh Okay, so of course this explains why she can't get away with lying, because he actually knows who she is. Though I did find it interesting that when she had to go talk to Mary Malone, she was pretty honest with her. Like, she just sort of laid it all out there on Mary Malone, and good for Mary Malone for not, like, losing her mind and calling a psychiatric ward on this child. Why is that good on her, though? I just think it's interesting. I'm, I, I, like, I sort of, I remember reading that, admittedly, the first time, and I was really confused as to why Mary Malone was so calm about it. I was like, okay. I mean, if I started talking about this to, like, my, my teacher, she would probably recommend me a psychiatrist. I'm very confused. I think we're meant through Mary Malone's introduction or a little bit earlier to kind of see that she's sort of meant to be off beat is the only okay. word that comes to mind. Okay, but like, remember that in if we're looking at this as an inversion of Paradise Lost, true, Mary she's Malone the is the snake. Yeah, she's the snake. The Interesting. So that's kind of critical when you're thinking about that in terms of her, because she's kind of one of the more heroic characters of the series in general. Like she's mm-hmm. considered a protagonist and a good guy and whatever. But she, her character is literally the serpent. Like she is mm-hmm. the Tetris. Um, she's so that's interesting. It is of course, in that we this world, like her. in this world, it's good. You want her to be the temptress because you want them to lose their innocence, um, and you want the fall to happen. But you know, it's kind of like, oh, Mary Malone, like, why would you do that? And why would you just accept what Lyra's saying? But then you remember, you know, in the metaphorical, philosophical world, like, she's the snake, so. I find it interesting that she's, she's not going to get yet. in anybody's way. 
Yeah, I find it she's an enabler. She's the, yeah, but but isn't it kind of interesting that she's the snake, and yet Lord Boreal, who's one of our big antagonists, his demon is a snake. Like he's sort of like the flip side of that, I suppose. But I found like, especially when I started reading it through that that lens of this is the immersion of Paradise Lost, and I very deliberately read it in lens um, a couple times. I always found it interesting that Boreal's demon was a snake, and yet Mary Malone is the serpent. But I is think if her... you go with Paradise Lost, though, because Lu- <laughs> Lucifer is actually kind of an interesting guy in Paradise Lost, you're like, you know, I can kind of roll with this dude. Like, I get him. I get him a lot. He's yeah. I, so I, I guess they, that's sort of more what Pullman was going for. Um, to take the serpent to be like Lucifer. Well, if like you were supposed to have read a different book before reading this book to be able to get this book, it should have said so. That's fair. No, you shouldn't have had. You shouldn't have had to read another book to get it. So if you don't get it, then that's a flawed book. Mm-hmm. Like I don't have any problem with doing background reading. I did not catch the hint from the quote in the first book. I thought it was just, oh, hey, look, that's where the name His Dark Materials comes from. Um, and I, like, um, okay. No, like, you so, shouldn't, it's seriously, like, that's a that's a valid criticism, is that, like, you don't, um, if you haven't read Paradise Lost, or if you don't go into these books knowing that that's, like, background, but you still, and you don't understand the books by themselves do not accomplish what they're supposed to be accomplishing, then that's not good. Yeah, that's you know, you like can just take book. it at value and take it like just as a story it is, and even without reading into it, I think you can still enjoy it that way. So I don't think it's, I think it's just like an added layer underneath that, you know, might yeah, enhance I mean, your reading. I mean, whenever I'm talking about this book, I'm talking about it at face value because I don't have any other way to read it. Yeah, yeah. that's that's yeah. what I got. Yeah, well then <laughs> at face value, it absolutely makes sense that we're sitting going, why is Mary Malone so cool with this girl just waltz? And saying, hi, your dust, those, your shadows are my dust, and those are angels, by the way, I'm from a completely different dimension. <laughs> yeah, oh, sorry it's, about that. it's just really unrealistic, and it really, like, bothered me. No. Um, okay, more reasons why Lyra bothered me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mentioned that I loved the Alana series, and that I loved, well, I, I don't think I mentioned this, but I did love Harry Potter, and I loved Hermione as a character, because she is... 10, 11, 12, and she still makes good decisions. Like, she's the one holding Harry back from being an idiot. She, I, I hold my female, young female heroines to a high standard because I love my young female heroines. I do. And so that's what made this series so incredibly frustrating for me was the fact that every step of the way I was comparing her, not less consciously, but, you know, thinking about it, what would Alana have done? What would uh, Keladri from uh, Protector of the Small, what would Hermione Granger have done? And they all would have, like, okay, come on, Lyra. Put your alethiometer, which is the answer to everything in the universe, in the pocket of a backpack and throw it in a car with a stranger. Are you serious? Yeah, that bothered me when I read it, too. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, what? This is the person that we're trusting the fate of the universe to <laughs> yeah. are you kidding yeah that's fair she does oh i, I agree that about 80 percent of the decisions she makes are pretty bad they are pretty bad like especially when i read it now and i'm just like oh why why did you so that that was just my major problem with this series i I never thought it was a bad series. I never had too much of problem with the setting, except at the beginning where I was like, okay, why are they saying Africa when this is supposed to be like a different world? But I just, I could not get over how much this main character frustrated me. I just couldn't. I tried. I tried to get over it. I know that other people really love this series, but I just couldn't get over it. Yeah, so I think like when... Will? No. Really? Did you like Pan? Not really. But did you, <laughs> you like, like Serafina Pecola? <laughs> Pan didn't have that much of a personality. I think he's so highly tied to Lyra for the first two books, especially. He's such an extension of her. But he's he's kind of like the... So, are you guys... Have you seen Kiki's Delivery Service? Yes! Yeah. Okay, so one of my favorite things about that is that the Gigi the little cat um, is kind of like the 
grumpy uncle, I would say, that's, like, along for the ride. And he's always the one that's like, this isn't a good idea, Kiki. We shouldn't be doing this, Kiki. Do they do it anyway? I feel like Pan was a lot that character. Where yeah. he didn't clearly didn't have the power in the demon-human relationship. But he was the one who would say, uh, I don't think we should do this, Lyra. This is a bad idea. What are you doing? Lyra, what are you doing? Lyra, we can't do this. But then, because he didn't really have control over her, she would do it anyway. But I, I thought he was interesting because he was kind of like this external, conscious sort of thing. Which made me continue to lose respect for Lyra because he made very valid points. <laughs> it's true. Like, this is a piece of your soul, okay? The demon is a, a piece of their soul. It's horrible disaster, end of the world if you're separated. Like, it's torture, it's death, whatever. And he says, hey, we're probably going to die if we do this. And she's like, I'll do it anyway, because I'm Lyra. And I don't give a fuck. <laughs> if she'd actually add that to her dialogue, it would have been great to hear. <laughs> but no, I think that's fair. Do you think maybe, although I agree that it happens way too often in the series, where Pan is making a very valid point, and Lyra's like, fuck off, little demon, I'm moving on, we're still good. And he's just like, oh, shaking my head. Do you think at all it rep- if it had happened a lot less, I guess is what I'm trying to say to set up this. Um, it's at all that point where e- even as children, as adults, we often have points where we want to do something. There is that little nagging voice in the back of our head that says you really, really shouldn't. But you kind of go ahead and do something anyway. Although I do agree that she does it way too often. Do you, th- like, do you at all think maybe that dynamic between them where Pan is making the very valid point and saying maybe you really should go and do the thing and Lyra's like, I'm gonna go do the thing is sort of representative of that sort of thing that happens in our own heads where obviously we don't have demons. Sad face. Well, it mm-hmm. seems like that was the intention, like, mm-hmm. to have, for demons to be different from their owners and, like, normally of the opposite gender or whatever. Mm-hmm. It does seem to be that sort of voice in the back of your head dynamic, but There's also people, like, completely external to her, uh, and she should listen to Pan because they have this special relationship, they grew up together, they're part of the same soul, but, like, the Chevalier and every single person who's not Lyra (laughs) is just constantly saying, hey, hey, uh, that's probably a bad idea, maybe we should, instead of just bopping around the land of the dead, maybe we should go, like, save the land of the living. And she's like, nope, bye! And it's really irritating. Mm -hmm. But, okay, well, so you haven't gotten to the end. But you obviously know that at the end they kill the angel that calls itself God. Um, And, uh, spoiler, spoiler alert, I guess, at the very end, what they are committed to doing is restoring the kingdom of heaven, essentially. Mm -hmm. In as much as that's a thing in a godless world. Do you you think that that could have happened if Lyra was any different way? I mean, like, couldn't Will have just done it? No. Well, then I I don't know enough details then, because I haven't gotten there. Hmm. So, I I would, what I want to ask is, if you could have any other character being in the position that Lyra is in, like, being that important and having to do all the things that she either should be doing, isn't doing, is doing, who would you have rather seen in that role? Well, Will was a lot more Mm task-oriented. Like, when she was like, oh, I've got to go to the land of the dead and hug Roger because I feel shitty about it instead of just waiting till I actually f- am dead. Um, he's not like, oh, great idea. I got to see my dad, too. He's like, uh, no, people who are dead are dead. We got to fix problems in the real world. And then he follows her anyway because he's a ding dong. Um, <laughs> he's in love with her. <laughs> okay, but he's a little bit more task oriented and he's a little bit more realistic and a little bit more logical. So I did. I liked him better. Mm-hmm. He, you know, he makes plans. <laughs> He's like, oh, hey, my mom needs someone to look after him. I know this person I'm going to put her with and I'm going to like occasionally check up on her during the using the alethiometer and stuff. He makes plans. He follows through the plans. He stops and thinks occasionally. So that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. I am a fan of that. Yeah, yeah I have to say I like <laughs> Will a lot more than Lyra in general. Yeah. I think in terms of who I, I love want my team. Will. Yeah, I love Will. I'm like, okay, I think realistically I want Will on my team. Can I have all of Lyra's sidekicks on my team? Like, can I be on team Lyra's sidekicks? Seraphina Pekala I want on my team so badly. Especially yes, she's- yes. She made logical decisions. She made plans. She sought evidence before making decisions. She, like, had a brain. I loved Seraphina Pekala. Like, I want a yes. whole book on her. 
please. Yes. And if, I would rather read a book about her. If I could then also get the Who movie to continue it? having her played by Eva Green, it would make me happy. Uh, D, did you, um, someone, so again, for our listeners, often when we have book things, we have a Facebook group where we're talking about the books while we're reading through them. And someone mentioned a joke post in there, and I think it was you, D, maybe it was someone else, about, like, Spoiler alert, Seraphina Pecola finds out that the prophecy was about her the whole time. <laughs> I think she goes it was on to save the world and all is well. Like who was that? <laughs> I would have really, really, really preferred that. I would have been like, hey, write that or did someone switch. else? I wrote that. I was like, okay. you know, bait and switch. We thought it was gonna be about this bratty <laughs> kid, but instead it's about this like wonderful adult human being, a uh, witch lady who like Again, she does her homework. Like, she has balls. She has courage. She's able to, like, sneak around and listen in on private conversations and whatever. But, like, she does it. She does reasonable things. Mm hmm. Yeah. So maybe when you become an adult and lose your innocence, you gain, like, logical thinking. <laughs> well, but, Will, but Will is a child, too. Don't forget. So I think it's just when you're not Lyra or Roger. <laughs> Roger also has issues. Oh, God. poor. Um, oh, Roger. <laughs> but yeah, that was like that was my big barrier between this story and me was how much I profoundly disliked Lyra. Uh, particular, like I almost put the book down when people decided to follow her into the land of the dead. I was so disappointed. Yeah, I was like, if I cared more, I would have been heartbroken because it doesn't make any sense. It's just not, I'm sure it has some meaning impact on the end, but like the reason she gives, she's like, oh, I feel shitty that my friend died. Uh, who cares, really? feel shitty <laughs> that's fair though i mean like if you can't get past the person who is your predominant protagonist it's really hard to get into a book i mean i've had that problem with plenty of other things i've tried to read and so i i feel that i could see why that would definitely be a serious barrier for like upping your enjoyment of or really being able to get into the story as much as you could have i don't know how to phrase this anymore I think it made sense. Okay. I, don't know. I also I also felt like I was being super rude because I know that a lot of people care about this book a lot, but I feel a little bit better now that you guys have mentioned that Lyra maybe wasn't your fave. Mm -hmm. um, but I was kind of tearing her apart in the Facebook group, so I do apologize if that hurt any feelings. No, I thought they were hysterical. I was I, I was <laughs> like I would just start laughing whenever I read them. I went, oh wow, this is great. Like, it was just the way that you wrote them, I thought were hysterical. Like, you made great points, but, like, the tone was so funny that it was like, this is great. I'm not offended, trust me. The most offended I think I've ever been people when they talk about this is just when it flats out, when they just, like, flat out start insulting, like, people for liking it. Then it's like, oh. Let's talk about the banned book status. So, actually, I kind of want to open this with one of my favorite things that I think this was also, Dee said this. Um... As a fun fact, it looks like Twilight bumped His Dark Materials off the top 10 most challenged books in America. <laughs> so clearly that tells us that in America, we are far more concerned about sparkly vampire loss than about killing God. That's what I said, yeah. America. Accurate. Um, <laughs> so I think that that is a pretty accurate and hilarious and makes me at once giddy and sad. Yeah, I, I find that so interesting. I just find that so interesting, probably because, I mean, I, I've said it a couple times, the most I think I ever got shit for reading a book was when I read these books um, in elementary school, probably because I still lived in Buffalo, New York, and everybody was like, no, yeah, whatever, we're New York, we don't care. Um, but especially when I then later moved to when I was rereading it in high school, I got a lot of grief for reading these books. I don't know what it was. I mean, nobody from like said, a like, religious perspective. Oh yeah, yeah, and especially yeah. what I found amazing was a lot of people who had gripes. I was like, "Did you have you ever read the books?" And they said no. And I said, "Well, then how can you make a judgment if you've never read it?" That I mean, that let, baffles. Let's me. be real. I judged Fifty Shades of Grey before I read it, and then I read it, and all my judgments were true. Yeah. Okay. That's. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be fair with that because I did the exact same thing. So I at least <laughs> won a bet when I read them. But I mean, um. But, yeah, I, this is it, one of the only times I ever got a lot of grief and harassment even over reading a, a, a book was, well, I mean, it was anything by Philip Pullman because I read something else of his in high school um, that, okay, understandably, the title could probably piss a lot of people off. It was called The Good Man Jesus and the Scoundrel Christ. Um, okay, but that is so good. 
I I'm love sorry, that continue. book. But yeah, but when I was reading his Dark Materials, I got a lot of shit for reading it. And I was just like, am I saying anything? Like, am I telling you that, like, your God is not real and, like, I'm telling all this shit? I'm like, no, I'm sitting here quietly reading to myself. Fuck off. Like, I, I think it's interesting that, like, people are more worried about Twilight. When in high school, I saw everybody reading Twilight. And I got shit for reading his dark materials for, like, you know, the whatever time I was reading it by that point. I don't know. I've read it so many times I've lost count. But good grief, America. Really? We're worried about sparkly vampire lust. I, I pulled another quote from Pullman from an interview about the banned book status. That was, I was, I've been surprised how little criticism I've got. Harry Potter's been taking all the flack. Meanwhile, I've been flying under the radar saying things that are far more subversive than anything poor old Harry has said. My books are about killing God. And it's like, yeah, Harry Potter was for sure on the banned book list. And it just is. because <laughs> wizards and witches are a thing. Yeah, I never understood that because I'm like, dude, the fundamental message of like Harry Potter was love. Wasn't that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> part one of the fundamental things about what Jesus said a lot of the time? I'm really confused. Though I knew... Yeah, I get really confused about what people get up in arms about in this country. Because I... Okay, so I went to a Catholic high school. Spoiler alert. I don't know if that's a spoiler alert. Um, but I remember my morality teacher said, would say, like, you know, the Harry Potter books are evil and he would never let his children read them. <gasps> but he was... But he, of course, is a huge fan of... Tolkien and oh, the Lord of the Rings and it's just like all about and okay okay to be fair Tolkien was Catholic and those books are like super heavy religious symbolism but the mm. Christ figure is still oh I'm sorry wait what oh, a wizard. wizard um so then just saying that Harry Potter is evil based entirely on the fact that it's about witches and wizards is like mm, I'm or gonna go even... with no on that one that does yeah. not make logical sense so, and then even I don't if you know. say like C.S. Lewis, I mean, the Christ figure's a lion. Don't most like Catholics and stuff say that animals don't have souls, or is that a different one? Because then well, I find Lewis that even was more a Protestant, so uh, I can't speak for Catholics on that one. Damn, I was gonna go somewhere with that, but whatever. I'm not the biggest fan of Lewis, which is probably where most of my arguments involving his dark materials stem from. Yeah. yeah, so actually, we're going to be having a conversation a little later this month that people will get to listen to. Hopefully, it's going to be a special Christmas special about religion and children's literature where we're going to discuss these issues in Harry Potter, Historic Materials, and Narnia, and C.S. Lewis in general a little more. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, I want to go back a little bit more specifically to Historic Materials because one thing that I found really interesting thinking about its banned book status and people getting, like, flack and stuff, is that my brother, God bless him, ha, irony, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> when he was, so I'm going to go with, he was probably 13 at this point. We did this book club. Like I mentioned at the beginning, the first time I read these was for a book club that was, like, religious in nature. And people had, you know... The, you know, everyone was up in arms at the end, like, oh my god, they killed God, and what's going on? But they wanted to talk about it, which I think is a really important thing. Um, but Rob pointed out, so this is my older brother, at 13, he goes, okay, but isn't the point that we should be taking out of this, whether or not they killed God in this universe that the books exist in, that they obviously didn't kill God, because the God that exists in these books is not the God that, like, we believe in oh. as Catholics, and so the whole point is it was a really old and tired angel that called itself God. So why are we getting upset about her killing something that called itself God that we don't actually think is God? And it was just a kind of, it was a very, very interesting thought that I have held on to, philosophically speaking, of when I think about people who get super upset about this is, oh yeah, like they killed God in that book. And then me thinking about, okay, but if you are a religious person and a believer, is your God in your head really weak enough to get killed by a kid in a book? Like, is that actually something that you find challenging and threatening? And I don't know if you guys have thoughts on this. I think that's a really good point because this, I mean, that's sort of something is kind of similar to what I used to retort to people when they would talk about, like, how could you read something about killing God? Or even when, of all things... When I got crap from people from reading The Da Vinci Code, like, I swear that one really baffled me even more. But um, I'd be like, 
are you so insecure in your own like religious omnipotent figure that something happening in a fictional book is one going to threaten you, but that you could believe in the case of his dark materials that a little girl who is all of the many things that D uh, reiterated from the book earlier, all those horrible attributes to her could just kill it. And, and that's it. That's the end of it. I'm like, really? Because I think that's the person who then needs to revisit what they think, not me. The, the reason that books are banned, though, is not because they make actions happen in the real world. It's because they make actions happen in your mind. <laughs> Thought is dangerous. <laughs> it, it, no, really. Like, mm-hmm. that's, it's, not, it's not like Harry Potter suddenly made witches real. So sad. It's, uh, it's not like all the books on, that are banned because of teen sexuality like instantly impregnate people who are reading them. It's because they start thinking about it. Mm-hmm. They start mm-hmm. thinking, oh... This 14-year-old character had sex. Oh, this 12-year-old character questioned, like, the things that she was taught. It's not It's not because it makes it real in real life. That's not how it works. Yeah, so speaking of sexuality, so this is interesting um, because this is something that I've always wondered about in terms of its banned status in the U.S. Um, so, D, I don't know if you've gotten to this part, but there is, at the end of the Amber Spyglass, the sexual awakening sequence, which is extremely important. Mars and, the scene. and partially cut out of all the U.S. editions. And so this is interesting, <laughs> is that actually it was censored when it was brought to the U.S., as Matt, I'm sure, would t- love to talk about oh. a little bit, is there's a much more explicit scene in the British versions that was cleansed a bit when it came to the U.S. Um, and what I find interesting, and I feel like, have we talked about this in a book table episode, or Matt, did you and I just talk about this? You and I just talked about it on our own because I mentioned it how um, I recently, and by recently, like a couple of years ago, bought brand new editions of the His Dark Materials. Because I had an old set of U.S. paperbacks that I had since I was like eight, and they were really beaten up. And I'd actually uh, gave them, uh, well, the first <laughs> at least, away to someone who was trying to build her like middle school library. And I said, here, go ahead for your classroom habit. Um, and in, I'd found out, and I can't remember why, probably because... And I really like something I tend to get almost tunnel vision obsessed with it. And so I'll do a lot of like deep research on it. Um, I was looking up stuff and I'd realized that my version of the Amber Spyglass, because it was the U.S. edition, had been censored. And that just like immediately made me very, very upset. And I had actually gone in and handwritten the, the bit of the passage that had been cut and changed into the book in like blue pen, like going all the way around the page so that I had it in there. But I said, eventually I said, okay, I need a new set of these. And the UK paperbacks are really, really, really pretty and they won't be censored. Um, but yeah, I always found it so interesting. And it's not like there was all that much that was cut. It's really only a couple sentences, but they're kind of important sentences because they make the fact that Lyra is having actually a sexual awakening a little more obvious. I think the U.S. publisher, I believe it's Scholastic, was clearly nervous about just those couple of lines. And, I mean, to their credit, did a fairly good patch job of the sentence of, like, I never would have known if I hadn't, like, read that it had been censored. But I do find it interesting that it was censored. I don't know if later editions still have the censored passage, yeah, no, it's still censored. I just bought the really? omnibus for this, and it is. What? And so, but what I think is interesting, so this is the key thing for me that I would love to hear a little bit from Shelley and Dion is that so this book was censored before it went out for mass publication, and what was censored from it in America was not the part where a child kills God, but the part where a 13 year old has a two sentence sexual awakening. So why I guess I'm just like still baffled by the fact that it was seen as more threatening by U S publishers for Lyra to realize that she's a sexual being than for her to kill God. And I don't well, if know. If you censor that, it's not even a book anymore. Like right, that's you can a significant point of the plot. Right. So yeah, if I mean, if the whole series had been building up to her, well, okay, yeah, if like she had, you know, nearly been killed 500 times in her quest to become a sexual being, 
if that's even like a thing, um, then they couldn't have censored it. But like they, so they couldn't censor Killing God because that, like the author and the editor and whatever would never have allowed it to be published. So they went for what they could do. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I just find it also interesting that instead of maybe almost cutting that entire paragraph, which they could have done, arguably, they just cut like two lines and kind of smooshed it together. I, I'm like, why didn't, like, if you're going to censor, why didn't you just go all the way and cut that whole paragraph and keep going? Because you probably could have. Why well, just but is this the same is it the same issue though because even though obviously like the main point is they're gonna go kill like this god character but especially for Pullman and I know for me as a reader the fact that they have the whole marzipan scene and the sexual awakening and even though Pullman's not sure if they had sex or not I am sure <laughs> that they did just gonna throw that out there um that was like also critical and key so I just I don't know if they could have taken that whole thing out that is true because like that is kind of the whole like because she eats the you know she eats the fruit or whatever I actually, it is have a, I actually have a quote by, from Pullman uh, let me see okay so he says um, well the Dark Materials is, of course, a retelling of the Miltonic Temptation and Fall, but most of that happens after the Golden Compass ends. And what I wanted to do was represent the fall as entirely good. It is good for people to know things to grow up to become sexual beings. And that's what he says is sort of the critical part of the story. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, that is sort of interesting. I just also think it's so sad they cut this bit out because it's actually really nice writing, too. Like, that just makes yeah, me if sense. anyone listening to this is wondering about this censored bit, because I haven't quite gotten there in the book, I actually pulled up the Wikipedia page, mm -hmm. and it is its own section. It shows you, like, italicized what has been censored and what hasn't. So, yeah, on tip, if page. you're wondering for censorship, it's on Wikipedia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, that, Wikipedia. I, I think that's probably where I first saw it, was for some reason I was just scanning the Wiki page, and I was like, changes to the US edition? What is this strange thing? What are we talking about? And I went, and I was equal parts enraged and like really well just really enraged when I first read that though so that had to have been a couple of years ago I think I was yeah it just that distresses me it just distresses me so much I mean I think obviously they took out some of the juicy bits and they took out some of I mean what the author had intended mm -hmm. because it's what he wrote but I don't think like reading the two passages side by side it doesn't change like the plot it doesn't really change what's going on. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I kind mm -hmm. of agree with that. Yeah, it, I think it is just more about making what is happening with Lyra at that point just a little more obvious and explicit, for lack of a, a little better juicier. word. Yeah, a little more like, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there anything we haven't talked about that you guys want to talk about or that you have thoughts on? Uh, I really liked the bears, man. The pants I... everyone are cool. Like yeah, they're pretty awesome. I thought it was it was neat that they had their own culture and society. Uh, in the first book, I and I posted this in the little Facebook discussion. I was a little bit frustrated by like it's clearly a different world. There's demons, there's steampunky stuff, but then they'll be like, oh, this thing's from Africa. This thing's happening in Italy. And I'm like, okay, come on, what did he just not feel like creating a whole universe? And I realized, yes, I did realize why he did that. Duh. Um, but that's how I was feeling coming into the first book for the first time. And so I thought it was neat that there's this completely different culture with like its own customs and its own history and like the physical characteristics of the bears. So I, I appreciated that section very much. Yeah, I thought the bears were really cool. And, and even things like the culture of the Egyptians and of the witches. I thought that was a really kind of neat culture, even though we didn't go too far into them. I thought what we got of them was really interesting. Um, Although the, the ending of the second book when Joe Perry gets killed, I was so upset. But I still get upset by that scene whenever I read it. I'm just like, oh, like you like now that I know it's coming, it really like you pretty much should know that it's coming. But oh, damn it. But I thought the witch culture was really interesting. Like, I, I wish I'd gotten a little more of that. Maybe it's because I do also really like Serafina Pekala. And so I'm like, I would love to follow her adventures more. More, please. Yeah, with the John Perry thing, like, I get that that was mentioned in one sentence beforehand that he had been involved with the witch, 
Okay, this is making me feel stupid asking for more foreshadowing. I am not a stupid person. I read a lot. I do pick up on things. I picked up on a crap ton of things in, like, Game of Thrones, for example. Yeah. Like, I said, oh, yeah, yeah, they mentioned that before. But there were a lot of times, and I don't know if this is because I started in the audiobook and you process, like, audio and reading things differently, mm. but there were a lot of times where I was like, well, that came out of nowhere. Like, eh. I think that um, might be an effect of the audiobook, because I have that... I have that same experience when I listen to like a new book where I don't know what's coming. I often find it a lot harder to do that sort of, I call it like background processing where you're kind of mm -hmm. analyzing all that because you're trying to keep up with the story because you're not visually looking at it at your own pace. Somebody is telling it to you. So I think that's definitely effective reading of listening versus like visually reading. So but yeah, I the actually... John Gary was one of those things where it's just like, and then bam. Uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I actually feel like I noticed things more because I was listening to the audio and I was like, maybe I was focusing more on what people said, but I was like, oh, why would they mention that she was in love with this random dude? Um, and so clearly that was significant, I guess. I don't know. Maybe it's also because I had such a big gap between like my readings of the series mm -hmm. that I just didn't you know, notice all these little details earlier. Or maybe I didn't really care. I was <laughs> just following the story. <laughs> Yeah, I know as a kid, I definitely didn't notice it. It was only like later. So I, I was going in with the benefit of already knowing exactly what would happen in all of the books. And I just went, oh, yeah, she sits there and mentions that she had a relationship with him and that she would kill him if she ever saw him. Wow, that escalated quickly. Um, Okay, <laughs> well, then. Hashtag normal. <laughs> Hashtag just relationship problems. This is normal life. <laughs> Don't piss off a witch. <laughs> Um, something I was going to say was that I really liked the, um, like, the different differences in science between Lyra's world and Will's world. Like, when we finally figure out that, um, you know, what the people at, at, in Lyra's Oxford were studying was, like, physics, as we know it, and they called it, uh, what was it, like, experimental theology? I don't know. I thought all that stuff was really cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really thought, and Dee, I, I would love to hear, because I know when you were reading The Golden Compass, you were bothered by, wait, is this our world? Is it not? Where are we in history? What's going on? And we were like, oh, this is plot, though. We can't tell you. It's plot with a capital P. Um, but I really loved how the world in The Golden Compass was just a parallel of our world where a lot of things were similar, but then many things were different. And it was sort of like a steampunk evolution. And then you had the magisterium that was sort of like the main power in the world. And so everything was in relationship to like the church and religion and theology. Um, so it was sort of, it was very like 17th and 18th century science from our world, except advanced in a more modern day steampunk setting in their world. And then it was a really interesting to me juxtaposition when then you actually get to our world, which is Will's world um, and the subtle knife. And I, I loved that. I just, I love the world in the golden compass and I thought it was really clever and fascinating, but I don't know D, if you felt better about it after you figured out what was going on or if it still bothered you that it was sort of our world, but not. Um, so I was able to, sort of deal with that better once I, I met Will's world. Um, but then I was uh, thrown for a loop again when we started just cutting into random worlds. Um, the most recent multiverse book that I read was The Long Earth, The Long War. Uh, and the multiverses in that series are like very, very similar. The ones that are, you know, right next door. I think they call them, like, one east and one west or something. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, there's a valley where there's a valley. There's a lake where there's a lake. There's pine trees where there's pine trees. And then you go further out into the multiverse, and it's like, okay, these are, like, further away from us in the, the sort of tree of things splitting in the multiverse. Does that make sense? So, like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so the, the I guess that are, the ones that are right next door, it's like, okay, maybe these things changed a thousand years ago and then the ones that are further away they changed three thousand years ago so like something like that so they were more similar and then when we started in the subtle knife or the amber spyglass cutting into like yeah, and suddenly we're in a desert and suddenly we're in a tundra and suddenly there's animals with diamond shaped bodies like what so that that threw me for a loop yeah i guess the comparison to that is like the the worlds are very like organized in the long earth and stuff like that like they're kind of like sorted by how different they are right 
But here yeah, it's yeah. just like you have these two worlds that exist next to each other and they've been next to each other for like all of time and all the decisions that have, you know, been different in each world have sort of made them evolve differently. So I don't know. I thought it was really cool. I mean, like Rebecca said, only since the 1700s or something, because obviously they still evolved Homo sapiens. They still evolved like the same social situations like monogamy and family units and whatever, and even very similar cultures. So the fact that our world and Lyra's world were so closely related was like, okay, I get it. I get what you're doing. And then suddenly the Mufala or whatever, Mm -hmm. like it. And I think, and I agree with you that that is a little like confusing and why are they so similar, but then all these other worlds are so different. But I think part of that was necessary to just the, because you had a whole book to learn Lyra's world um, and to understand it as like, a parallel to our world and then you obviously don't need a whole book to be introduced to our world because the readers live here theoretically um but then all of a sudden you're visiting all of these other worlds and universes relatively quickly and so i think part of it was there needed to be something about them to make it clear that they were distinct and that we weren't back in lyra's world and we weren't back in will's world and we were elsewhere um and so i mean like i can i can see why that's frustrating and kind of annoying and it feels like a creative failure in a way but I also don't know how he could have constructed more worlds that were just like super similar with just a slight difference considering how little time they spend in some of them yeah just have everyone speak German like do <laughs> do, do a world where the Germans won a war do a, wor- a world where the Indians won a war it's not hard okay mm-hmm. I sound like an asshole no, you I don't. Sound, no. I sound like, oh, I could have written this better. I don't believe that at all. I just, um, I think I'm being over, like, almost devil's advocate analytical because I know that you guys have this attachment. So I think I'm being, uh, I think I'm, like, pushing you guys. No, it's That's not, fine. I, and you do yeah. not need to apologize for being critical. Like, it's so awesome that you're in this conversation because so often we have conversations where everyone's like, yeah, I agree. Let's all yeah. talk together about how we agree. So this is really good. Yeah, it's good to have someone playing the devil's advocate because you'll bring up things where, I mean, even for those of us who love it and who cherish it, I and mean, we can sit there and go like, oh, yeah, there is kind of an issue with that. Maybe, like, we never really thought about that. Especially with stuff with the multiverse. Though I will say the Mufla, whatever they are called, those things, that I, I still read that and just usually start shaking my head because I'm going, I can't imagine these things at all. I have such a hard time imagining this world. I just That's one part where I just go, I will listen and pretend my brain is running a film in its head, but it's not. There's just kind I of a I remember really liking mark. them. Like, I, I liked them. Read, yeah. I yeah, haven't I read yet, them. but um, they, mm-hmm. they were part of my like favorites of the book. I don't know why, but <laughs> just because they were so different, I guess. Yeah, they are kind of out of left field, kind of odd. I like I like them. I just can't ever really imagine them real well. And um, when I read, there is usually some form of obviously like imagining everything playing out sort of like a film reel in my head. But those are always something where I'm like, there's just a big blank. We're not I'm not really sure what I want them to look like, even with the description of them that we get. I have a really hard time imagining them. I don't quite understand what they were meant to look like, which sort of makes me glad and a little sad that there isn't a very good, that there isn't an Amber Spyglass film, although there maybe hopefully soon will be some version from the BBC where they will imagine them for me. And I'll be like, oh, so that's what they're supposed to look like. I will depend upon film for this to give me an interpretation of these things. (laughs) They were always kind of elephant-like to me, but I'm not sure if that's meant to be if that's right yeah they definitely have trunks okay right i didn't yeah. i did i wasn't imagining the bit in my head with trunks good <laughs> like did anybody i know rebecca has has anybody else here seen the film of the golden compass yes i have and uh, i did not mind it i was fine with it but i didn't you, i had when is, um i think i hadn't read the book recently like when i watched the movie um mm-hmm. So, you know, I guess I was like, oh, this is cool. I remember the story. Yeah, it is kind of sad to me in that I managed to get my hands on one of Chris White's, who's the director's earlier drafts. Like, he'd actually written a draft of the screenplay, and it would have been a much better movie. Like, it really would have been a better movie. I think I sent it to Rebecca. I did send it to you, right? Didn't I? I think I did. 
that version of the screenplay for the Golden Compass that was like done by Chris White was a way earlier draft of it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, this would have been a such a better movie. Like, yes, it's not a perfect adaptation. Um, those of us who are in film often say there is, like, kind of no such thing as the perfect adaptation, just because you're taking one medium and having to turn it into something else, so you always lose something in translation. But that script would have been a much better movie. So much better. But we do get basically a second try at it. The BBC will be doing some adaptations of it, which I find quite exciting because let's hope the Brits can do it better. So what was wrong with it? it yeah, um, so Shelley, I would be really interested if Shelley would watch the movie again um, because I just watched it recently, right when the reread started. So I watched it in October. Um, oh, yeah. And I own it because I remember liking it the first time I saw it. And I remember everyone complaining that it was a terrible movie. And I was like, no, it was fun. It was a golden compass. <laughs> and I like almost, I had to be doing other stuff while I was watching it because it was so bad. And the thing that's terrible about it is the cast is phenomenal. You know, you oh, have like Daniel Craig and you have Ava Green in there. And I can't even remember who all, oh, Nicole, um, Nicole Kidman, Pittman. Ian McKellen. Oh, yeah. Like the casting yeah. is literally perfection. It's, it's the phenomenal. script. And the cinematography is great too. Like I mm, love the yeah. way they create the world and everything looks really cool. But the script was just like, they took all of the really bad cliches of script writing and they happened in there. So it starts with this like super high level, like there's a weird um, like slideshow of things happening. And Serafina Pekula is basically just like, so in the beginning there was dust and then we did this thing and this thing and this thing. And then you just go into Lyra's Oxford and it's really, really jarring and it doesn't make a lot of sense. And it was a really kind of lame beginning that was not well done and then everything else in the movie is just all of the dialogue is like kind of short and clipped and like lameified versions of book dialogue <laughs> that's very cliche it's kind of hard to describe but it really is just the script it's basically writing. yeah it's ultimately a serious script issue because it got distilled to the point that it's um boulderized but it is an absolutely horrific script it's awful and the worst part is is especially having read that other version of a script because there were obviously multiple versions of this of whatever scripts were getting were in development i went god that other one would have been better but the ending is one of the biggest crimes that ever happened and the set because what happens is we remember the ending of uh the golden compass they literally chop off most of the ending it's literally just Lyra being like, I'm never going to go with you, Miss Coulter, and then running off. Like, we don't even get the bits with, like, Roger and the bridge and her crossing over into the other world. Because they clearly wanted to set it up as the first film in a series for a franchise. But that's not the way you do it. And the other sad part is, is they'd shot the initial, the original ending. They'd shot it. From what I've well, gathered from interviews, it's the producers who stepped in and, like, yanked the ending out of the movie. And I went, it, you don't just leave us there how well from that i get the idea that they didn't want to make more movies like they wanted to make it more of a closed ending than a cliffhanger no they weren't intending to make all of them i thought they well the the whether they made more were dependent upon how well the first film did but i'm like wouldn't you want a more closed ending if you wanted to make sure that like whether or not you made more you at least had a complete movie because the ending it just sort of cuts off and i went there's there's really no ending here yeah i can't all. remember exactly so um yeah, and, but yeah i, I definitely would like to rewatch it now that i've listened to the book so recently mm -hmm. um and i might be doing that with tim yeah. i don't know sometime in the future yeah and, and i i if there were things that i liked it was sort of what rebecca pointed out and that the casting was great the costumes and the cinematography were great it was the script that killed everything and it just makes me so sad that I'm like, if this had had a better script, you guys really could have had a great movie. Because you had all the other ingredients ready. Like, they were all there. Yep. It was just the chemical X didn't work. Yep. Okay, I have to go, though, guys. I don't know if you want to wrap up or if you want to continue without me. But, um, well, then, <laughs> does anyone have any final thoughts they'd like to close with? Just worth reading, not worth reading. Would you recommend? Would you not recommend? Overall, I always recommend it. 
Like, the, I, I again, I'm biased. I always recommend it. Although, I am careful in who I recommend it to. Like, if I think it's someone who might be offended by it, I'm not likely to recommend it. But in general, I usually recommend people give it a shot. Yeah, I definitely think it's worth reading. Um, it's a very cool, like, universe. And even if you just, you know, skip over all the subtext, well, some of it's not subtext. Like, let me say <laughs> straight out that, like, oh, dust is original sin. <laughs> like, stuff like oh, that. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Just in case you missed all that. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think it's a, it's a cool series and a cool, like, um, world and all that. So I would recommend it. I, um... I don't generally like to recommend things with a caveat, but I think in this case I would. I would say I, I would recommend it, and I would probably warn the person that they might not like the main character because I came in, <laughs> I came in with very high expectations for her. Honestly, people love this book. They they talk about it a lot. I realize they don't necessarily talk about Lyra, um, <laughs> but they they do. They say you know this is a great book. It meant a lot to me in my childhood. And to me, I instantly equate that with a main character who is likable. Um, so that's <laughs> that's how I would recommend it, I would say. I think it's a good book. I think it's worth checking out, especially if you're interested in um, the more subtextual stuff. But be prepared to not like the main character. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, awesome. Book table out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> roll credits. <laughs> <laughs> The Book Table is a podcast from Backroom Whispering Productions. Our theme music is by Mark Wayne. If you like this podcast, rate us on iTunes. Or get in touch with us on Twitter at Backroom Whisper, on Facebook at facebook.com slash backroomwhispering, or by email, backroomwhispering at gmail.com. See you next time! <laughs>